This morning, we are going to continue our series called Revealed at Christmas. And the idea behind that is that God began to reveal his plan, the broad strokes of his plan when Jesus was born. I mean, can you imagine what happened in the spiritual realms as they watched the son of God become a human being? And like, I don't even know what all that process involves. That's beyond me to even understand it. But I just think about spiritual beings watching this happen and how blown away they were. I mean, they, there's no way they could have any idea. And we know that that plan plan unfolds and works through, and we're going to celebrate Easter in two or three days. That's what it's going to feel like. All right, it's like, boom, it's Easter. When we're going to recognize that God's plan is unfolding, and it begins to unfold at Christmas, right? I mean, we think about Easter and the cross, and I know that the, the spiritual forces of darkness were not ready for that, right? I mean, if you think about it, like, we're pretty pathetic, I mean, we're pretty weak. We, we don't live very long. We're, we're, we're kind of emotional. We're kind of physically not super strong. I mean, we're like, you know, I mean, every time a spiritual being shows up in the scripture, you know, we're just terrified, right? And yet Jesus came and he lived and he died for us. Like that's true love, isn't it? I mean, we can do nothing for him and yet he died for us. And this is the beginning of that story. And we rejoice in the fact that we were alone in the dark. And he said, I'm not going to leave you there. I'm coming. I'm coming in the form of a human being. And we rejoice in that in this Christmas time. God has revealed the broad strokes of his plan. But listen, God desires to reveal himself to you personally as well. You know, God has an infinite consciousness, which means that he is able to see you as if you are the only person on the planet, as if you're the only person that ever lived. And he wants to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. And I think during this Christmas season, he wants to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. He wants to reveal his plan. You know, we're, we're hopefully entering into a, a new season of the world. And uh, we can get through this season, which has been a little bit of a struggle. And you know, we're entering into a new year. And I think God wants to reveal some things in this season, in this time, in this Christmas time, to help us, to guide us into that. Amen? I mean, I'm okay to be the only one in the room that, uh, that is waiting on God to speak, but I think that he wants to speak to us. And uh, so we're going to look at a story this morning of someone that, that God spoke to, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and uh, look at how God revealed himself in their lives. And I hope that uh, the Lord will speak to us this morning through their story. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 5, it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you, will, you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Let's pray together. God, we come into this moment celebrating your son, Jesus. 
magnifying you and blessing you, Father, for what you have done for us. God, we bless your name. We come into this moment, Lord, asking that you would speak to us and guide our hearts. Father, I believe that you have been with me in my time of preparing for this moment, and I ask that you would help me to be clear as I communicate with your people, God, what you have put in my heart and in my mind. Father, I I pray that you would guide us. We need your words. We need your strength. We need who you are, God. So come and speak to us and be with us through your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. I wonder if there have been people in your life that you thought were your enemy, and then later on you found out that maybe they were more of a friend than you supposed. You know, when I was in high school, I played basketball, and I know that's, that's shocking, right? I mean, that's the question I get everywhere, and I, my standard response is, no, I'm a jockey. And not everybody gets that, but... Um, <laughs> But I I think it's funny. It makes me laugh, and so I deal with all the questions uh, in that way. But, you know, Coach Doss, my basketball coach in high school, he had a hobby. I'm convinced it was a hobby of his. Uh, He loved to yell at me in front of people. That was like his, that's, that's what really made him happy. He would yell at me in front of my teammates, but he did that so much it kind of became, you know, common or whatever, but he, he enjoyed that. He would yell at me if the cheerleaders were practicing in the gym while we were practicing basketball. He really loved to yell at me then. You know, low, he would call me and blow his whistle and everybody would stop and, and a look and he would yell at me and it was, it was awesome. And... <laughs> Another time, my mom would always come. My mom was at every game, and he loved to yell at me in front of my mom. I don't know. That one seemed to give him the most joy, was just yelling at me and singling me out in front of my mom. And I look back, you know, and and in it, man, I hated it. And, and, you know, I kind of hated him. I don't know. It wasn't really. It was, you know, it was one of those things. But looking back, I realized it took me years to look back and realize, you know what? I wasn't the kind of person that when he yelled at me, like I, I didn't shut down and sulk. It made me angry. And when I got angry, I played harder, and it actually lit a fire in me. And, and I, I look back, and I'm like, maybe he was just on to something, right? Like, I thought he was my enemy, but maybe he was my friend, you know? And I remember in college, there was a professor, and you've heard me talk about him before, but Dr. Bowdell, and, and Dr. Bowdell's tests were legendary. And, and I don't know if, if, if they even have blue books anymore. Maybe some of you remember, like, blue book tests and, and whatnot. I think everything's digital now, so you don't know. But we had blue books, and a blue book test meant that you had to write out longhand, like, every answer and it was in paragraph form and his tests were like that and they were so hard and I would try to dodge Dr. Bowdle, right? Like if I could go to summer school and take a class that he taught so I didn't have to take it from him, like I was in summer school paying extra just to get away from Dr. Bowdle. But he was one of the major professors in my department and so that I couldn't dodge him and, and I look back now and I realize, you know, it's the things that I learned in Dr. Bowdle's class the things where I really had to dig down deep and really internalize and process, it's those things that have stuck with me over the years. You know, I thought in that time he was my enemy. I was trying to get away from him, but maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was the best professor I ever had. You know, when, when the kids were little, we would take them, you know, when it was time for their shots and we'd take them to the doctor. And, and it was such an interesting experience because you'd walk them in and they would be smiling and they would be happy and, and, and you know, just kind of enjoying life and everything. And we had a great nurse, Nurse Kathy. Uh, she was just an amazing, uh, amazing nurse, amazing lady. And the kids would smile and laugh with Nurse Kathy. And then Nurse Kathy would grab their arm and stab them, <laughs> Right? And you want to, I mean, their whole deal changed, man. And I mean, they're screaming and and we loved it. She would always say, you know, when she was done, she would say, get them, get them, get them, get them, get them. And so now we we say that and it's great. It's a great memory. But man, just watching their face, like they like, you know, hey, there's Nurse Kathy and they love Nurse Kathy. And then, man, after that shot, buddy, they wanted away from her and they didn't like her and they were screaming. You know, their minds, they couldn't conceptualize that in that moment she was doing something to help them. And, and, and they just viewed her as what? They viewed her as the enemy. And, you know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you in your life. I'm sure somewhere along the way you've had somebody, whether it was a coach or a teacher or, or, or a boss or somebody, a mentor along the way, and you thought, man, this person, I, I think they hate me. And you know what? I might hate them, right? Like, I'm not sure. Like, they seem like the enemy. And then years later, figuring things out. You know, sometimes even our spouse uh, can seem like the enemy, right? I mean, they, they say things, they don't agree with us, and we're like, you know what? And then you realize sometimes their perspective saves us, right? That they're not actually our enemy. We look and, and uh, many times a boss will do something or a supervisor will do something, and, and, and we're like, you know, why are you doing this? You're making my life miserable. And then we find out later that they were making hard decisions that maybe even saved the company, saved your job, right? And you look at that and you're like, in the moment, 
like hated you. <laughs> and all the while you were really on my side. And I mean, it gets to the point where even like random people, <laughs> like you can even think random people are against you, like that person driving slowly in front of you, right? And you're like, they are against me. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, customer service, you're on the phone with them and you're like, this is obviously your fault. Why will you not cooperate? Why will you not help me? Well, the truth is that person driving slowly in front of you, they are your enemy. They have planned out very rigorously <laughs> their treachery, and, and it, it takes a lot of detail to get in front of somebody and to drive slow and jack up their life. So, you know, <laughs> respect. But the other people, so many of the other people in our lives that we think are our enemy in the, in the time are actually not. In fact, there is a scripture, and there is a scriptural principle that just, just saturates the Christmas story. And, and, and when we recognize this, it can be so helpful. Often we are not very good at telling friend from enemy. There's often times in our life when we're just not good at it. We, we think this person's against us, and that there's a whole nother sermon probably coming 2022, and that is we think that they're for us, right? <laughs> Woo, that was too heavy for Christmas, okay? Um, but we think that they're against us, and they're actually not against us. And you see, we're often, we're just not very good at telling friend from enemy. You know, the Apostle Paul said it this way in Ephesians 6.12. And yes, it's Ephesians 6.12 again, because this is really an important scripture. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What he's saying is, how, how often is it that we confuse and can't figure out what and who our real enemy is? You see, for our struggle one of the fundamental ways we are broken is that we cannot help but default back to struggling against flesh and blood. Prayer and the other ways we engage spiritually do not feel like progress in the same way as walking out the door and making something happen in our timing, in our strength, and in our wisdom. I want you to leave that up there for just a second, Mark. You see, I think this is something that is so important to us. And, you, and maybe you're tired of hearing of Ephesians chapter 6 and, and verse 12. And you're like, Pastor, seriously, like we, we see that a lot. But we continually, I think this is how we're broken. Sin has broken us. And one of the ways in which we're broken is that we continually run back to our own strength, try to do things in our own time and in our own wisdom. And, and we maybe come in on Sunday morning. We maybe do Bible studies. We may be in a class. And for a period of time, we're thinking, you know what? I really need to engage spiritually. I need to, I need to deal with it on this level because this, the invisible things are the permanent things. And the invisible things are the things of God on which all of the visible are built on. And maybe for a season, that that becomes real to us. But I'm convinced that we're broken in such a way that we continually default back to, I've got to do this in my own strength. I really need my own wisdom. I really want this to happen in my own time. And that is a, that is a place that takes us into a, just a, a, a season and a time of confusion. Because when you don't know who your friends are and, when you're, and who your enemies are, it's a very confusing time and it's hard to have peace when you can't even tell which way is up. And the scripture continually points us to the reality and the fact that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There's spiritual things underlying these things that we need to address. You see, we're not alone in this. And, and that's, it's so encouraging. The scriptures, is just one of the main joys of the scripture is that it shows us that we're not alone, you know? I mean, you see these people in the Bible and they struggled in the same ways and with the same things that we do. And we see Zechariah here. And Zechariah and, and Elizabeth have been struggling for many, many years. You know, it's obvious that they've been trying to have a baby. They've been trying to have a child. And you remember that they lived in a culture where having a child and carrying on the family line was, was one of the most important things in the Jewish culture. In fact, in Elizabeth's words, she said that she was living in disgrace for all of these years and the struggle of that and the struggle of, of God not answering your prayer. And the, you know the thing about these people? We read this verse earlier, Luke chapter one and verse six. It says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. 
And I don't know about you, but I've been in seasons of time when God was not answering my prayer and, I, and then you kind of start that self-evaluation and you start saying, God, you know, how am I letting you down? God, why am I, you know, failing? God, why are you answering their prayer and not answering my prayer? God, where are you in this? God, are you for me, right? And I look at this story and I see that there are years in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life where this is what the Bible says about them, right? I mean, I don't know about, well, that's a lie. <laughs> I do know about you. <laughs> and I know about me too, right? I mean, this verse is not true of me. <laughs> I mean, there's nobody that would say, you are blameless, you are perfect, man. You are righteous in the sight of God, right? I mean, there's, no, there's nobody, there's none of us would live up to this standard. And yet we see in their lives that there is a prolonged, years-long season to the point where, now, I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty of the, of the physiology and all that stuff, but to the point where they are so old that the dream is dead, okay? They are so old that the dream is dead. And, and they're, they're, this, is, this is turning and churning inside of them to the point where, I mean, here's Zechariah. He's a priest of God right? And the lot falls to him to get to go into the temple. Now, you got to recognize that there is no guarantee that a, pri a priest could serve their whole life and never get a chance to go into the temple, okay, and to offer the incense. And the lot fell to him, and he was going to get a once-in-a-chance lifetime. This would certainly never happen again, okay? So he walks into the, the, the temple in front of the altar of incense, and not only does he get this great privilege, but then an angel shows up to speak to him. So he's in the temple, he's a priest, an angel is talking to him in, right there in that moment, right? And, and just one of the funniest lines in the story, you know, Zachariah says to the angel, and he's like, you know, says to Gabriel, he's like, how, how do I know this is true? And Gabriel, I mean, he could just, I mean, he could just swat little Zachariah, I mean, you know what I mean? He's like, flat out an angel. I mean, everybody's terrified when they see an angel, and the angel is there, and he's in the temple, and Zachariah's like, I don't know. But what, does that, but what does that show us? That Zechariah in that struggle, that years-long struggle of seeming God not answering his prayers, God not hearing his prayers, he had gotten to the point where he wasn't sure really who was for him and who was against him. I mean, I'm here in the presence of God talking to an angel messenger of God, and I'm not sure, right? Like, how am I supposed to know this for sure? And Gabriel tells him, listen, if this moment can't speak to you, you're obviously missing something. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you just not be able to talk for the next 10 or 11 months. You're just going to have to listen. You're just going to have to hear. And you're just going to have to watch what happens. So those 10 or 11 months go by, and we read it. I mean, he goes home, and, and Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And you can imagine, I mean, if you're, old, you know, if you're old and you're beyond childbearing years and you become pregnant, you know, you... You know, I get asked all the time, like, how tall are you? Did you play basketball? You know, I mean, you can imagine she goes out, she's that old, she's pregnant, and they're like, it's awkward questions, right? So for five months, she's like, I don't think I want to deal with this, right? And she kind of backs up in seclusion, and it totally, it totally makes sense. And at the end of that time, you know, the baby is born, and, and, and they name him John just like Gabriel told him to. And when, when, when Zechariah writes out, you know, his name is John, immediately his voice returns to him. And, and as the first words out of his mouth are Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 69. After 10, 11 months of not being able to talk, when he, when he gets his voice back, it says his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised them up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. How awesome is that, that in that moment, after not being able to talk for months and months, the first thing out of his mouth, I mean, what would the first thing out of your mouth have been, right? I mean, probably correcting some kids and saying some stuff, you know, or whatever. But in that, in that time of silence, he finally recognized that God was for him. He finally recognized that God had been working throughout his life to bring about his plan, that God had not ignored or rejected his prayer and his service of obedience, but God had been saving a special place for him. 
You see, John the Baptist, their child was John, who grew up to be John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that timing had to be perfect. That timing had to be in God's timing, according to God's plan. Even though Zechariah and Elizabeth looked and said, certainly, God, you've got to answer this prayer. In fact, God, listen, you've got to answer this prayer by this time, okay? Right? It seems you're begging for a biology lesson, but I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> God, you've got to answer this prayer by this time, and that time comes and goes. And they're like, God, we have been faithful to you. Why did you not hear our prayer? But God says, it's my timing. I want you to know I have a special place for you. I'm going to bring about the answer to your prayer exactly when it needs to happen so that your son John can be so world-renowned that people are going to confuse him for the Messiah. And he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And, and guys, I mean, I know, I mean, we struggle. We, we cry out to God and we say, God, why aren't you answering things the way I, I think you should? And God, the, the time has passed. God, what, what's happening and God says, listen, I hear your prayer. I see you. I'm working. You can't see it. From your perspective, just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, man, the time has come. Maybe the time has gone. And it's going to take a miracle. But guess what? God still does miracles. He still answers prayers. And, and you know, we recognize that this whole story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, they don't know really who the enemy is. I mean, at a certain point, they had to think, maybe God's the enemy. I mean, I've devoted so much time to him, and he hasn't heard my prayer. They don't know who the enemy is. But if we take a step back, we recognize that this happens in, a, in the context of the Jewish people having no clue who the enemy is, right? I mean, they thought, in fact, if you had pulled a Jewish person aside at that time and said, hey, who's your enemy? They would have said, the Romans, right? I mean, they tax us to death to the point where we can't live. And all God's people said, <laughs> sorry, that's as political as we get, I promise. And, and just to be fair, whoever it is, they all want our money, okay? Um, they tax us to death to the point where we can't live. They defile our nation and all of our holy sites. We can't worship the Lord. If we could just get rid of those Romans, and you know what they turned the, the, the prophecies of God into? Well, when the Messiah comes, he's going to get rid of the one that I think is the enemy. When Messiah comes, he's going to take care of the Romans. But what happens? I mean, Jesus Christ is born. He's the Messiah. Does he get rid of the Romans? No, the Romans are there for hundreds of years after the Jewish people are dispersed. No, but he conquers the spiritual enemy. He overcomes and overthrows the spiritual enemy of our souls. He destroys the power of death, hell, and the grave. If it had been up to the Jews at that time, he would have gotten rid of the Romans. But now, because Jesus knew that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, he knew that we wrestled in the spirit. He conquered in the spirit so that our victory could come in the spirit, which is eternal, not just in the physical enemies in front of us. I wonder if I got you to the side and I said, who is your enemy right now in your life? Who's robbing you of peace in your life right now? I mean, many of us, there would be a person and we would name them and we would say, it's this person. And if this person was gone, if this person was taken care of, whatever happened, I would have peace, right? Maybe it's money. I mean, you know, it's Christmas time and trying to figure out all the things and the presents and all that, and maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a situation you've been dealing with. I mean, job situations are, are kind of tough right now, right? I mean, do I quit? Do I go to greener pastures? Do I do this? Do I stick this out? Like all this, you know, what's happening? Maybe it's COVID. I mean, you know, maybe COVID just keeps like coming around and however it's affecting you directly and indirectly, and you're just like, you know what? If COVID would go away, my life would be peaceful. Paul comes back and he says to us again, your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And God, Jesus came so, to die so that we could have peace in the spirit. 
and recognize that ultimately we are going to win. Are you using all of your energy? Are you spinning all of your wheels, trying to wrestle in the flesh, continually coming against these things that we could all name and say, oh, this is the problem, oh, this is the problem. If this changed, this is the problem. You are not very good at determining who your friends are and who your foes are. Why don't you leave it up to God? Why don't you submit to him? Because I want to tell you that God wants you to have peace. Jesus Christ died for you and destroyed the power of death, hell, and the grave so that you could have peace. Hebrews 2.15 says that we lived all of our lives in fear of death, but he conquered death. The, the, the things that you really have to worry about are all taken care of in Christ. He's come so that you can have peace. As Jesus is preparing to leave and, 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 and be crucified and then ascend to heaven, he's telling his disciples about the Holy Spirit coming. And he tells us one of the names of the Holy Spirit. I know you've probably read this verse before, but go back and read it again if you don't believe me what I'm about to tell you. And, and that's okay. But look in John 14, 27. As Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, he says, peace I leave with you. Like grammatically, does that even make sense? Except that he's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. He says, peace, that's his name. It's one of his names is peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Pastor, are you saying that all I got to do is just like sit around and pray and then everything's going to take care of itself? No. What I'm saying is that's where we need to begin. If you begin from a point of understanding that Jesus' birth was not in vain, his death was not in vain, that the Holy Spirit inside of you is not in vain, but that he has won the ultimate battle then it begins you starting to deal with all of the things that we have to deal with from a place of understanding that we are walking in victory. We are not walking in defeat. Those enemies that you think are your enemies, they are not your enemies. God can change it just like he did in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. In one day, in one moment, in one encounter, that whole situation can change. Say, so, well, why hasn't it happened already? And Zechariah would come along and say, you know what, I thought the exact same thing. God, you sure are dragging your feet. God, don't you realize she can't have babies anymore? And God says, it just, I could show up in an instant. So why don't you have peace? Why don't you recognize that Jesus was born to begin an end to your battle, to your strife, to everything that you have to fear. Your enemy is defeated. That is the message of Christmas. And as we enter into this next week, I believe that God wants to speak that over us. Whatever it is that you think is your enemy, whatever it is that you've been just wrestling with, can we recognize the victory that Christmas represents and walk into this next week? You know, this week is going to be busy and it's probably going to be a little stressful. There's going to be the gettings here's and there's and everywhere. There's going to be the family members that you're struggling with and you're going to have to spend time with them. There's going to be all the financial things. Then it's going to hit and it's going to be all the job things like leading into next year and all of those things and all that's going to hit. But God wants to give you peace. He wants you to walk in an understanding of what he accomplished through Jesus Christ. Can we in this moment surrender to him so that this week can be just characterized by the peace of God? Lord, we come to you. We come to you in a spirit of surrender, God. God, we confess our sins, Lord, that we have been continually wrestling in the flesh, trying to figure things out in our own wisdom, trying to do things in our own strength, God, over and over and continually. But God, in this moment, will you teach us how to surrender to you? Father, this doesn't remove the fact that we still have to perform actions, but God, will you give us the strength 
God, will you give us the peace? God, will you give us the understanding to know that, God, we are walking from a point of victory. God, that the enemy has been overcome in our lives. He has been defeated, Lord. And that you are not slow, as we suppose, in answering our our prayers and our cries to you. But God, your answer will come in perfect time. We trust you. Our hope is in you, God. Will you allow your peace to settle down upon us? We thank you, Jesus. And we worship you. Amen. I wonder this morning, and I know that the the great temptation is to just jump out of that seat, to run for that door. There's Christmas portraits, there's all those things. But I wonder if this morning, if you would just take a few minutes, you know, the prayer team's up here, they would love to pray with you about something and you just want to surrender it to God before you enter into this week. You know, you don't have to pray with them. Maybe you want to step to the side and, and, and pray. Maybe you want to just sit back down in your seat and pray and just take a minute. God wants you to have peace this week. Do you want it? Do you want peace? Why don't you just take a minute right here, okay? I mean, I, I preached amazingly fast. It's like so early. You've got time. They're not ready for you, whoever they are. Why don't you just take a minute and just say, God, I just want to surrender this to you. I want to surrender this thing that's weighing on me. I want to surrender it to you. Let's go ahead. We're going to stand. I'm going to dismiss you, and then you're going to be free. You're going to be free to either pray or you're going to be free to just run out the door. And if I see you running, I'm just going to assume that everything in your life is perfect. And you have no problems at all, okay? God, we come to you, Lord, and the thing I ask you for every week is for peace for your people. And I pray that your peace would be upon them. In such a way, Lord, that those people that they interact with this week, those people that are around them this week, they say, what's different about you? And our answer will be, God has given me peace. God has made me secure in knowing that his timing is going to work out. And I trust in him. I thank you for this peace. And I pray your blessing on your people now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Peace be with you.